Hello and welcome to True Crime Diary, a light-hearted podcast on a serious subject. Every two weeks we look back through true crime stories to discuss an event that took place on this week in history. I'm your host Mark Decano and with me as always are my friends Jed Lester. Hello. And Rue Turner. Hello. So the date we're looking at this week is March the 31st and in 1952 one of Britain's war heroes and the father of modern computer science, Alan Turing, went to trial for gross indecency. So this episode is a little bit different because we are recording it from the former home of our subject this episode, Alan Turing. The first thing I'd like to do is say thank you very much to Sophie for letting us record in your lovely home. My pleasure. <coughs> yes, uh, we're very uh, honoured to be in the house. I'm just, just in case no one believes us, that was his, it might have been his table. <laughs> <laughs> that was his wall. I don't know whether you can hear that. Um, someone turn the light. I oh, know that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> we are literally sat in the bowels of his former lodgings in Hampton, which is in southwest London, which he lived during the war. Um, <laughs> it was just after the war. It was, it was 1945 40, to 47. 47. While he worked at the National Physics Laboratory, which is in Teddington, which is about a mile away. Before we start, I suppose, what we would like to get across is the fact that we are obviously here to champion his, uh, him and his work, and we're shoehorning in the fact that ultimately and officially he was tried... Uh, no, he was, he was... Yeah, he was tried and convicted for the crime, as it was at the time, of gross indecency, which... For the listeners who don't know, it basically means he was homosexual, and that was in itself a crime at the time. A crime to top all crimes, a crime that will live in infamy. But we're using the podcast to champion him and his work by brilliantly doing it from one of his former lodgings. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's very key for us to, is that we're in this house where he stayed. And um, again, this is part of the time period when he was doing some, some of his... Uh, great works in terms of the origins of computers. Um, he'd already been a war hero, having helped solve the Enigma problem, etc., which we'll talk a little bit about. Well, a rather invisible war hero. Oh, well, they yes. still couldn't talk about it to anybody. <laughs> well, absolutely, yes. In fact, it's quite interesting. One of the things that I've learned was that he did work on a particular topic that some would say was extraordinarily influential but he had difficulty publishing on it because it was based on notes he'd made while at Bletchley Park and therefore he couldn't talk about them right. and therefore couldn't explain his ideas so even even after the war the official secrets act was keeping him from explaining right 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 how clever how he lo- was. to how long well, yeah, for it, it yeah, forever. doesn't expire yeah, yeah right right yeah. I signed Despite that government. did you yeah what? For the military work that I used to do. Hang on a minute. <laughs> I used to work on uh, military radar defence stuff. Should should you not be telling us that? <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> I think, moreover, you should be sitting here. <laughs> Just can't tell you what I did there. Really? Are you, as Alan Turing was, uh, a recipient of the Order of the British Empire? No. No? no. You're not Rue OBE? No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> not so great after all, are you? No. <laughs> you and your secret life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're all subject to it. We're oh, all subject what? to. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're all subject to the official secret act. But occasionally, it is required upon you to sign it, really, just to bring your attention to the fact that you are subject to it. Um, I don't know. It doesn't bring you any closer to being subject to it. But if you're given information and told that you mustn't release it under yeah. official secrets, then you you can't, whether you've signed or not. <sighs> There you go. What do you know? <laughs> All those secrets I gave away. Could be in trouble. Anyway, Sophie, so tell us about uh, perhaps when you first moved in or if you had, well, currently the lodgings that he occupied are as your son's bedroom. <laughs> yes, we think so. Um, this house and the house next door were bedsits until about until the late 80s and then they converted into two houses and uh, I don't really know very much about the house from the 40s but I do know from people who you know a few older people in the area who said oh I've been to your house it was a big party house so I think there was oh, a, wow. I think there was that kind of vibe at least mm. at least later so it was there was a lot going but on. the houses or house 
were all split up into bedsit flat, yeah. flats. So th- there were, I think, 14 bedsits that they turned into wow, wow, two wow. houses. So it would have been pretty busy, hmm. sort of comings and goings. Oh, yeah, yeah, him. He around here someplace. He live upstairs on the fifth floor. And he lived here for three years. But it, it, it's interesting because the house is, it's quite a grand looking Georgian house. And the, the way that it looks from the outside is very much like one house. So it's a slight misrepresentation of how he would have lived. And I get a lot of people coming past and they see the blue plaque on the outside. Mm-hmm. And um, they maybe imagine that oh, he had a slightly more yeah. uh, opulent lifestyle than yes, he would, right, right, certainly right. would have done. So my study is right by, the window is right by the blue plaque. So I get a lot of people every single day, people having absolutely the same conversation sure. to their partners or family or whatever yeah, they, yeah. as they pass by. They say, well, who's that then? You think your name's going to be on that plaque? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, generally, one explains to the other about the film. So since the right. film oh, came the film. out, oh, right. there's, been a, there's been a lot more interest. And yes. I think right. prior to that, he just wasn't as much as a, of a celebrity. So um, what about my the, personal uh, audit of, of people coming by and the comments yeah. they make, generally, it's been, well, it's been much busier. So that would be the, the imitation game with uh, yes, Cumberbatch. exactly, right. exactly. What about since the... Uh, Fifty pound note. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean it's it's hard to distinguish. I think that I've think never that, seen one actually. Have you who, seen one? Who uses a fifty pound? Well, I know. I don't. I don't use cash. Going, what would you pay for with your fifty pound? I know. Note? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I've, I've seen. I don't. I have not seen one at all. But the. Uh, but anyway, currently, uh, listeners, he is on the back. The Queen's on one side, and he's on the back of the current fifty pound note. Yeah recently voted he was voted wasn't he yeah. as to be on it yeah and who he beat there was a public poll in 2019 and the note came out last year 2021 yeah so I, I don't know who was in the in the poll but people were allowed to submit their choices and then it was narrowed down from that but most people very obviously have seen the film exactly which would have helped and, you know, that sort of enduring appeal of course yeah, um, yeah. when we moved in uh, quite excited to have the the plaque and the association with Alan Turing Mm. and we bought a book of his work Um, so now all the books available on Turing are all about Enigma it's it's almost all you can you can read about Uh, and I think we managed maybe a page or two I mean (laughs) you you know you you were talking about he wanted to write his no one would have read it I don't think it's uh, the maths academics is is unbelievably well funnily enough it's it's completely inaccessible Mark attempted to do some research and I um, I was trying to think of a way of explaining even for my own understanding how I would how I'd explain what the uh, the Turing machine is and I did some research and I didn't understand any of it so I, I typed in Turing machine for dummies and I, <laughs> I didn't understand that either so I basically had to distill it down to a, a single sentence it's uh, no, oh, it's complicated uh, um, 1944 he would have been building Delilah and machines like that it was a paper he wrote in 1944, which never made it into the war, but it was basically a voice encryption engine, which would have been a phenomenal upgrade from the Enigma if you could simply, instead of typing messages yes. into a machine, yeah. copying out the code and then transmitting that, yeah. you could just pick up the radio and speak, yeah. and everything that you said would be deeply encrypted until it got to the other side. Yeah. That would have been quite a, quite a change. Yeah. I mean, it did work. But that was never used. It did work. It wasn't used. It did work. He tested it, didn't he, by... With using one of Winston Churchill's speeches. He oh, encrypted yes, it yeah. and then decrypted it. Wow, wow. So, yeah. When he lived here and he worked at NPL, what was he doing? He was working on uh, st- the first stored program computer between 45 and 47, principally after Delilah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the thing, I think, the thing that he uh, he couldn't explain because of it, cause it was based on his work at Bletchley Park. Because he wasn't allowed to. Because he wasn't allowed to. Yeah. So, so I said, how would you work that, that out then? Um, I, can't, I can't say. <laughs> Yeah. Kind of have to pretend that it came out of whole cloth. Yeah, it's quite interesting because um, he basically he put forward what he he could, and then he couldn't explain it or talk about it. But then smatterings of that work was then used and worked on when he went back to Cambridge on like a sabbatical. And while he was there, it kind of got worked on in his absence. And that's the thing that the actual version of, that he'd intended wasn't built until after he died years later. First fixed program, first stored program computer, which is basically 
the beginning of computing as we would understand it, I guess. Oh, it's amazing! You're a genius! Yeah, that was the, what you called the A computer. Or yeah. the A machine, rather. Yeah. The automatic machine. It's, it's, his colleague dubbed it the Turing machine. Yes. Um, it's the, it was called the, um, the, the ACE, the ACE, yeah. Automatic Computing Engine, but he referred to it as the A machine, yeah. Okay, so the Turing machine. Obviously, there's Here we go. loads and loads of things that are named after him now. I mean, there's buildings and streets all over the world that bear his name. As I say, in my research to try and explain what it is, I couldn't understand it. So I've managed to distill it down to one sentence, which I've written down. So I've written here, um, it's a hypothetical computer that can calculate anything that is possible to calculate with as simple a machine as possible. It's an amazing machine. It's basically theorizing the simplest procedure, mathematical procedure for interpreting any possible calculation. Did you understand that? Well, had he invented? Is, he just, is that just he saying theorized it? it. Yeah. Or has he actually invented there is, something? Well, there's a, there is a principle. It Anna could... Sophie got it in her cupboards. It's probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, the idea came out of a paper in 1928 by David Hilbert, which proposed the, the sort of a challenge or question that was still open in, was it 1934s? Yes. The, yeah. It was um, a Turing's paper. And... I can't remember actually the the basis of the the question, but what Turing did is he looked at the question really very literally, which people weren't doing. People were trying to describe it mathematically, and he looked at it very literally and and said, "This calculating machine must do this." So he said, "Right, well, what is this machine? Let's make this theoretical machine that does this, rather than try to write an out, you know, a a, a formula for it." What the hell are you talking about? Um, so he invented the notion of this machine which had a length of tape extending to infinity either side of it and it was looking down at one spot on this tape and it could see the information on that spot it would either be a Z, a zero or a one and it could then either read or write to that spot so it could, either, if it sees a zero it would then have an instruction set which would tell it either to leave that alone, delete it or stick a one in it and then either move to the left or the right Mm. And that's the fundamental of the Turing machine. It's the separation of the instruction set from the actual bit that does the work, which means that yeah. you can write a piece of software that would do anything. Turn off your brain, right? You can find online sort of videos of demonstrations of the Turing machine just adding two binary numbers together, and it's just yeah. a, a state machine instruction set that just moves this pointer backwards and forwards. Yeah. Exactly. But it's it's a phenomenal idea. It's so simple. It's it makes it almost impossible to understand because it's so simple. It's such a simple concept. <laughs> Turing published in 1936. His his paper was called "On Computable Numbers with an Application to the Einsteinung's Problem," which is Hilbert's yeah. work, which is basically means the decision problem, and it's a base. It's what you just described, and I'm not even going to try and do. Mm. But basically, Turing was theorizing whether the, the decision problem is whether whether a, 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 a machine could effectively just keep processing forever and ever and ever mm. basically um, that machine has been described apparently as um, the most influential math paper in history yeah now I'm not even going to try and move any further than and, that because it's yeah. numbers and how old was he when he published that 24 24 oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm nearly 50. I haven't published anything. <laughs> published I can't even understand what he wrote. 24. Yeah. Was um, he an academic at the time? Is that... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was already a fellow of King's College at 22. And when he was 15 and a half, his grandfather bought him um, or gave him a copy of Einstein's theories of relativity, the, the both of them, the, the 1905 and the 1915. Yeah. And he praised them for his mother. So she could understand it. Yeah. I mean, at 15 and a half. Yeah. And when he was, um, <laughs> when he was at uh, primary school, he would, have been, he would have been at primary school from between six and nine. And he, uh, one of his teachers there said that she'd, she'd had clever boys and hardworking boys, but Alan is a genius. Right. At that age. Yeah. He, he was being described as a genius. I don't think he seemed to see boundaries like to his or limitations to his own intelligence or to the ability of other people either he yeah. could he, you know he wouldn't be 
stopped by a problem because it's hard. It just it just attack it and move through it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, part of his part of his um, philosophy, if you like, was always to find the simplest. Way. So this is mm. about the Turing machine, being the simplest way of calculating and bring it back down to its most basic things. So I think yes, if you, if you encountered a problem that you couldn't find, you'd basically just try and disassemble the problem and find out the the simplest course of action based on the root of it. Yeah, and because he had a, an early, fairly strong engineering brain as well as being very strongly mathematical, yeah. I think that stood him in good stead by the time he got to Bletchley because he understood the, the physical properties of the electronic machines that he was building as well as what they needed to do and what they needed to calculate. Yeah. At 1939, um, when he been, went back to Cambridge, he would go to lectures uh, by Wittgenstein, who was uh, one of the apparently acknowledged as one of the 20th century's greatest philosophers. He'd go to his lectures and Wittgenstein would, would lecture on the foundations of mathematics and Turing would argue with him. <laughs> He'd have long arguments with him about mathematics. So I thought that's fascinating because you've got this great great philosopher who's teaching mathematics yeah. and then t- the, you know, Turing, still relatively young, is saying, no, no, you're wrong. <laughs> The title of the movie, The Imitation Game, yes. that's what he called what we now call the Turing Test. He called it The Imitation Game. Oh, right. Oh, right. Um, and that's a test for um, artificial intelligence, as we would call it. Mm. Wow. The first iteration of The Imitation Game is a little bit dubious, because he, he, he described three actors in this test. Mm. One was a man pretending to be a woman. <laughs> the other was a woman... And the third was the the guesser, the tester. Yeah. And he would have to t- decide which was the man and which was the woman, and then he would take out the man yeah. and replace it with a machine. Yeah. And that was the original version of the imitation game, which later got developed more into, can you tell it's a human at all, let alone male or female? Yeah. It's an interesting way to... Or a man based on... And all his work is based on, like, computing to sort of start yeah. with. But he was very, very experiment. interested in the way the human mind worked, and that was never separate for him. He didn't sort of work on computers and then try to think about the mind. He was always deeply fascinated by the how the human mind functioned. Yeah. And he always believed that it's just a series of procedural decisions. Yeah. That's thinking. Yeah. And you can make a computer do that. Right. What I like about it is it's not... It, the idea is the guesser um, asks questions, usually in, in written form, so you don't get... It's not about determining whose voice is... is. Yeah. And he asks questions, and then it, it's about whether you can tell if the respondent is using uh, human responses. Not about... It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong, mm. because you would expect the computer to give the right answer. But if they give a an evasive answer perhaps that would be more human than, than the computer would do. and that's what he's looking for that imitation of and humanity. he predicted computers would be able to do it with about 100 megabytes of memory by the year 2000 <laughs> which we didn't quite manage yeah not there yet <laughs> where where were we by then were we we were a lot less capacious yeah we? we were doing pretty well i would say as far as computers and artificial minds go but Even we're not thinking that way then yeah and give it a unit of something that i mean that wasn't was that was that a widely used term i can't Not believe really. it would have no been. it would have just yeah. been a notion of the amount of Hundred what storage he thought was necessary <laughs> to make that kind of so for instance to give um I, to be honest, he knew he didn't know what he was talking about because my <laughs> zx81 <laughs> in Nineteen eighty-one. Hence the name. Oh yes. Yeah, is that why it was called that? I didn't even know. <laughs> uh, was in nineteen eighty-one. So that was nineteen years short. Uh, had one k of memory. Mm. Yeah. Now you can break the code. It was a, a bomber. It was a bomber. Yeah. Now named, does, named after the bombas. The Polish version. The Bombas Kryptologiczna, <laughs> which was actually... So in, what's interesting here is, so the Enigma machines were being solved long before Turing got involved um, by the Poles, by Poland. They'd been decoding Enigma messages for about six, seven years. Mm. Um, and they invented 
what I just said, <laughs> the cryptological bomb, um, which was a machine that that was adapted by Turing to make it more efficient and more. Because the, the French had a spy in Warsaw, yeah, and he was leaking information back to the Poles, yeah. describing how what the Enigma looked like and how it functioned. So they were using those descriptions to try and build machines that did what they thought something that looked like that might do. Yeah, yeah. I can feel it. The machine is good. It was a basic. It was a basic machine, but it works. It yeah. was working, and um, they said that they would have shared with their allies anyway, France and, uh, and England. But uh, they they were kind of their hand was forced when war was on the horizon. Victory machine was up and running by 1940, and there was another one that was slightly adapted again by someone else that worked with Turing by August 1940. By 1945, by the time the war ended, they had 155 of them. Those machines. And there's um, a lot around, aren't there? You said there were a lot. That's still a lot. Enigma, mach- Enigma machines, yeah. yeah, there's loads. And we kept using them for decades afterwards. We it's never amazing. told anyone we solved it. We used them right. all the time for encrypting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't until the mid seventies I think that we yeah. suddenly announced that we could we could actually decode them. We were just giving them out to other security agencies to use, saying, oh, it can't be decrypted. <laughs> yeah. Right. But we were just listening to all their messages and decrypting them. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> At the peak, we were decrypting 3,000 messages a day. Well, somebody's certainly been a busy bee. It was just unbelievable volume of yeah. information. Yeah. Exactly. I'm sure most of that was weather reports and messages home, but even that in itself will give you a little bit of information. Yeah, exactly. Weather um, reports give you locations and messages home tell you, usually give you a bit of information about what they're thinking and what they're doing. And wrong. Yeah. Um, the American program came up with their version of the bomb based on Turing's work. They um, intended to produce 336 of them. Um, that was one for each order of the wheels, which made um, Turing quite amused because they clearly hadn't really understood what they were doing. <laughs> it says, "Oh, we need for every every order of the wheels, we have to have a separate machine." Oh, okay. right, I no. see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't, uh, didn't have half that, and obviously, merrily <laughs> deciphering thousands of them. <laughs> so yeah, they hadn't really understood it. So I found that quite funny. That is funny. I didn't know that bit. When he, because he had quite bad hay fever as well, mm. and his solution for hay fever was when he cycled to Bletchley Park, he would wear a gas mask. Yes, yes. which I thought I was just that, yeah. would have been phenomenally amusing to see. See that even coming by. Yeah, yeah, but people cited that as one of his great eccentricities. Yeah, because well, yeah, they thought yeah. he was just a kind of a nut job who wore yeah. a gas mask. But it was he just used to um, paddle a logical his, solution. He used to paddle to his, his, his his mug to the radiator in the hut so no one would steal it. Was it these yeah. these type of things sound as if they should or were in the film? But surely that gas mask thing, that's mm. classic. It's a functional <laughs> and <laughs> scene of him yeah. peddling. Well, he's got a very mask. literal mind, very straight. But I mean, creative in the sense that he would find the most clear-cut solution to the problem immediately at hand. So I've got hay fever. I have a gas mask. Sure. <laughs> because it's the war. Okay. You know? yeah. yeah. It's just obvious to put that on. Chaining your mug is a brilliant idea as well because it's, it's probably just mental. the right length that you can continue to drink with it. If you can't get it to the gas. It's a bit mental. <laughs> that is. Chaining a mug. It's only a he, bloody mug. Only, only when he left it. I don't think he kept, he was kept it permanently safe. <laughs> I can't get it to my mouth. Yeah, but the banks chained the pens to the Yeah, exactly. Do they still? Or do they still do that? I don't know. I haven't yes. been in the bank. Yeah. I think you're thinking of Argos. <laughs> they're not chained. Do the people do they not have that anymore in banks? Pens chained? No, ba- no banks don't they... have sh- branches, let alone do pens. Banks, <laughs> do banks exist? I don't know. The film... It's, a, it's great to see the film. It's a really good film. Hmm. A lot of it is rubbish. So like Joan Clark, who was recruited by use of this crossword, she already worked at Bletchley Park long before then. So that was not true. Um, the crossword was nothing to do with the intelligence agency. That was put out by the Daily Telegraph uh, in a hope of finding smart people. But it was really? nothing to do with the actual recruitment process. Uh, the machine wasn't called Christopher. The machine was called Victory. 
they just put that in as a nice little affect for his childhood friend who died. But it's nothing that never happened. I mean, it had happened, but he never called the machine after him. And they added extra cables for the machinery to make it look more organic. They had like <laughs> veins on it and veins and, and arteries, but they didn't have that many. Mm-hmm. In the movie, uh, Turing outs a Soviet agent, but although the Soviet agent was working at Bletchley, um, he was in a different uh, group from Turing. They probably never even met, let alone oh, right. discovered his, uh, his uh, treason. But also, um, he wouldn't have had anything to blackmail Turing with. Because yeah. Turing was openly homosexual, mm. wasn't afraid of anyone knowing it. Yeah, true. <laughs> I mean, so that's the secret he really needed to have kept, arguably. Yeah. And the war mm. was the only secret he did keep, really, was his work during at Bletchley. Our job was to crack Enigma. Well, we've done that. Now for the hard part keeping it a secret. So let's talk then about Turing's trial and conviction. So we're talking about in 1952, uh, when Turing was 39, he started a relationship with a 19-year-old man named Arnold Murray. And on the 23rd of that month, Turing's house was burgled. And Murray told Turing that he and the burglar were acquainted. So when Turing reported the crime to police during the investigation, he acknowledged he had a relationship with Murray. And that was enough, because homosexuality was... Uh, criminal offence. Yes. So that was it. He yeah. did, it was just one was bloke it. saying, "Yeah, that was enough." And they went, "Oh right, okay." So, yeah. So they're going to go to trial. They charged them both with gross indecency. Um, Murray was he was given a conditional discharge. Turing, under the advice of his solicitor and his brother, pleaded guilty. So yes. they went to trial. He pleaded guilty to the charge, and he was given a choice. Basically, you can go to prison. Or you can have a treatment yeah. of um, diethyl subestrol, mm. which is basically synthetic estrogen. To, to, tr- to in a bizarre attempt to make him it's a chemical castration. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, effectively, yeah. It's basically yeah. It's, the plan is to reduce the libido, but it basically yes. it, it, yeah. it feminizes him, if you will. He grew like breast tissue. And, really? Yeah, yeah. It's just inhuman, isn't it? It's completely yeah. disgusting. It wasn't, wasn't the trial the first day of Queen Elizabeth's reign or something funny like that? Was it? That was 53. Coronation was 53. I yeah. think she was late 52, not early 52. Okay. It was a year that the crown changed hands. <laughs> You're saying she was involved? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was in a, in a different way. She became involved a lot later. She officialed a... Because she, she gave a did she par- pardon. Pardon him. Yeah. And, of course, she ended up on the other side of the £50 note. She did. There yeah. you go. So they're t- t- together at last. Together at last. Um, Some would say would... they're in cahoots. You know? <laughs> why would she be the one? Because she's the queen. The she's the queen. Because of being the queen. Yeah, I know, but isn't it kind of law that pardons things? The sitting government at the time um, decided to use the royal prerogative of mercy, is what it's called. So basically they went to Queen Elizabeth and said, sign a pardon. Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister many years later. I'm not sure when he was we Prime Minister. He was in the noughties. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was Gordon Brown. He said, uh, Thousands of people have come together to demand justice for Alan Turing and recognition of the appalling way he was treated. While Turing was dealt with under the law at the time, we can't put the clock back. His treatment was utterly unfair, and I'm pleased to have the chance to say how deeply sorry I and we all are for what happened to him. So on behalf of the British government and all those who live freely thanks to Alan's work, I'm very proud to say... We're sorry, you deserve so much better. That was his statement. You don't get statements like that. No. It's unreserved without caveat. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. pretty seismic, that one, wasn't it? Yeah. Obviously, that's a full apology. It. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Completely. Yeah. And in fact, they, they went further because in, in um, 2016, the Policing and Crime Act went through Parliament and it's now described as the Alan Turing Law. And it basically, it, it was a, it's an amnesty. It retroactively pardons all men who are convicted, convicted of um, homosexual acts. Right, right. So um, everybody has been there. Oscar Wilde? Yeah. I didn't realise till I started researching him what a keen runner he was. I mean, like a, a proper oh, yes. runner. Like a I knew that. Two, yeah, yeah. Two, yeah. But while he was, while he was yeah. living here... He ran his fastest time in a cross-country marathon um, in, I think, was it Walton? Anyway, he, yeah, he did it in 2.46.03. Yeah, which, didn't, he, didn't he outrun his own club? 
Um, they realised that he well, was he the fastest runner when he ran past the ball. <laughs> he came fifth in the race. In that fourth race. or fifth, yeah. Oh, right. But that was his fastest time. Oh, wow. wow. However, in That's nineteen incredible. in the in the Olympic Games the following year, yes, the winner of the marathon was only eleven minutes ahead of Turing's time. That's right. So, I mean, yeah. that's the kind of level of running that he wow. was at. You know? Yeah. Did and he not try out for the Olympics, or was he? Yes. Yeah. He tried for the 1948, I think. Olympics. Right. And also, he was only 11 minutes slower than the person, the Olympic runner. But he also he had an injury at the time, <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't running at his and, fastest. And, and this was cross country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was probably the Olympic wearing... Games marathon won't be cross country. No. It'll be a road race. And know? he was probably wearing. Brogues or something. He wasn't exactly wearing canvas shorts to the knees. (laughs) Have you got any other personal? So, amongst the stream of people that come past daily, Mm. there's been a few notable. Oh yeah, yeah. not famous, but just notable incidents. Uh, So I came home one day. We, uh, to find on my doorstep there was a gift. I think it was a an apple. pot plant. It wasn't an <laughs> apple. It wasn't Foreshadowing. An apple. A pot plant and a card. And yes. it was to Alan Turing. Right. And it oh. was signed from the people. Wow. Oh, wow. Which was interesting. Uh, I had another chap who knocked on the door and he said that his grandfather had been, had gone to school with Alan Turing and had been at Cambridge with him. And he was getting closer and closer to the front door to the point where he actually poked his head round and he asked if he could come and have a look round. And I said no. Uh, Mm. Quite right. So on the 8th of June 1954, at his final address in Wilmslow, um, Turing's housekeeper found him dead in his home. Um, He died. Uh, age 41, and the cause of death was cyanide poisoning. Now, it was ruled as suicide, but as always in these cases, that's been questioned quite deeply. Those who say it was probably a suicide um, cite the fact that there was a half-eaten apple at the side of his bed, um, and his, uh, he was re- apparently reenacting the scene from his favourite movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. A poisoned apple. Apparently. How did he come up with that theory? Yeah, well, anyway. He was a fan. That was his favourite fairy yeah, right. tale. Right. However, yeah. he made it a habit of eating an apple before bed every single every night. night. Yes. Really? And so, it wasn't unusual you know, to leave it half eaten. Yeah. yeah. Are we... Um, was, the apple was never tested. It wasn't tested for cyanide. Oh, right. He was conducting some experiments in his bedroom um, using... Um, I forget which form of cyanide it was. It was a potassium cyanide in That's solution. Right. yeah. So it was because he was experiment. He had it in one of his other rooms. He had it all set up. So it's like uh, you would use it to like dissolve gold and then re electroplate. Yeah, because he, he was a great experimenter. Yeah, so it was more consistent apparently with the idea that it might have inhaled it by mistake right. rather than d- yeah. dipping an apple sure, in a bowl yeah. of it and eating it. And as you say, the apple wasn't tested. But also, he had a list of things that he had to do the next day. Yeah. Um, and he right. was in the general jovial mood mm-hmm. all the previous beforehand. And conversely, he had just set up his will in the previous few weeks. Yeah, and there's, there's lots of kind of thing and forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's kind of why it's never really what, been. What resolved. was his state of mind in general? Would it have been very, very low? Uh, um, no, I'm talking about with various treatments. Well, reportedly, um, he was in good mood. Generally speaking, his uh, his. Um, hormone treatment his chemical castration would have ended a year before right. and even even at the time he took it in relatively good humor hmm. um but that had ended so it wouldn't have been depression as a side effect of that so that, that had already finished and from accounts ago. from friends he wasn't the kind of guy who you could grind down he would just bounce back he'd fight back happy well i don't know well, happy as the next man i guess and can i ask the Potentially ridiculously stupid question of the symbol of Apple. You can ask. On the back of the laptop that we're all looking at now. Yeah, that's just Ian's surname. Ian Apple. Ian Apple. Yeah. Um, is that a 
No. Uh, direct correlation? No. That's Newton, I think, isn't it? Lo- yeah, no. it's, I think it's from yeah. Newton. Yeah. I think loads of people have asked. Um, Steve Jobs was asked directly. Was he? Um, he said, does that anything to do with, with uh, is it an allusion to Turing? And he said, God, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you should, have been, you should have said yes. Should have said yeah. But I didn't. Because it's brilliant. <laughs> if that is the it's reason. purely coincidental. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Sadly. Yeah. yeah. Ironically... In the garden of the MPL is a tree that stands now. Have you seen it? I have. It's, it's a tree that has been grown from the seed. Oh, of, is it? From Newton's, Newton's apple tree? Uh, apple tree, yeah, yeah. That stands prou- barely half a mile away from here. Yeah. Uh, a massive apple tree, yeah. Which is a story he made up anyway. What? The apple tree story. It's just the story he made up to describe it. It was never actually how he thought of it. What the Newton yeah. and gravity? Yeah, no, I'm, I just meant just saying, physically. Let's suppose yeah. I was sitting under an. Yeah, apple. right. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't actually sit under. No, an no, no. Yeah, didn't. But that the tree is true. The, uh, yeah. Not the uh, okay. Yeah. Not that tree in the NPL. Yeah. We're talking the about NPL the tree. provenance of the tree. Yeah. Yeah. Is true, yeah. Not yeah. Newton's tree. <laughs> <laughs> there is one other possibility outside of suicide and uh, murder. Murder. Really? Yeah. Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Jealous lovers. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Foreign governments. Our government. Yeah, yeah. Rivals. Computer nerds. Are you about to say something or are you just no. making that up? <laughs> right. I thought you were pure... going to say something. <laughs> During his, his um, chemical treatment, he used to visit a Jungian psychologist who was, he was trying to help him sort of go through his sort of, you know, psychological problems as he saw them. <laughs> to use a lot of college, you know, psychology. And the psychologist had a daughter who was eight years old, and every time Turing would come round to the house, he would play with, he'd just get straight down on the floor and start playing games with her on the floor. Yeah. He was, you know, very affable, very friendly chap, even though he was excruciatingly shy, he was very friendly. <laughs> and she used to love playing the board game Solitaire, um, which is sort of like a, a cruciform board with marbles on it and you would place them on a little yeah. bit like checkers yeah, yeah. he wrote in a letter to her a solution for playing solitaire such that you would win <laughs> and I saw an interview with her and she to this day in in her advanced dotage <laughs> still does not understand this letter <laughs> <laughs> I went I went to Bonhams where it was auctioned a few years ago for a fairly considerable sum and I read it over and over again, and I cannot make head nor tail of it. And this is this is a letter to an eight-year-old explaining wow. how to play solitaire. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, what in this house? Not that I know what's in this house. That's his table. Um, what in this house could be directly connected to his work? Was there anything when you moved in? Was there anything left behind or like hidden in an attic or any, any remnants of previous tenants? Skeletons. No. Skeletons. I, no. Our, my predecessors did have a dossier on practically everything, but did not include... A dossier? A dossier. Um, mainly to do with some of the architecture in the house and the, oh. the stucco ceiling. Um, yes. When you were aware that uh, Turing lived here, mm. was that... Part of your decision, did that help your decision to move here? Was that incidental or were you more excited? You said you were excited once you were moving in. It was definitely a selling point. I yeah. mean, you know, was it? It was, it, the house is uh, quite unusual. It had the plaque and it's yeah. in this lovely town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there was a lot to recommend it. And just yeah. it was a, quite an exciting and, and different thing, have an opportunity to have a a blue plaque house and yeah. as I say we didn't really know that much about him at the time how long ago are we talking about 20 years or uh, it, nearly 18 years um, has his fame obviously in the last 10 has risen a lot dramatically but mm. then was he um, he was just only known by people who knew about wars and computers I think there was an awareness I think people did know about the enigma but it, my recollection is that it wasn't the main thrust of his work and that he, he was more known for being the godfather of the computer or the founder right. of the computer that's my impression and more of his 
very complicated mathematics. Yeah. Um, but so you said you've got a few cats here. Yes. Well, None of them are called Turing or Alan. However, in his later works, he did work out in a, a, a process that's called morphogenesis. He yeah. described the, the very quite simple chemistry of how really complex patterns, such stripes and spots, can develop in nature on, say, skin or on plants. We can now mathematically describe in, with chemistry how spots and stripes appear on animal skins. Oh, that's interesting. Just from the paper that he published. I mean, you, you wouldn't think that well, someone who just... It has an just, equation. It's a, it's a chemical process called morphomog- morphogenesis. I, the <clears throat> whatever fingerprint and the face of a tiger are exactly... In the sense that there's only one... As Every face of a tiger is unique. They're not the same in, in the slightest. Well, not the structure of the face, but the pattern. The design. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. yeah. The, the colouration develops. Is that then something that breeders use? Because, for example, Bengal cats, oh, yeah. there are fashions for the for the different markings. And yeah. sometimes the fashion is for rosettes, and sometimes the fashion is for stripes. Right. And they mm-hmm. evolve the the markings depending on what's, what's desirable at the time. I so. don't know if they use the, pro- the knowledge of the process. I mean, that's, I would think it would probably just be selection just forced yeah. selection It'd be selective breeding yeah. but yeah but but then the, the, that would be genetically inherited from the parent cats yeah um, so science well, is going on so, but it's unknown unbeknownst yeah. to the breeders yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. and he simply describes the method in which those patterns develop within the skin which is like, he's, How interesting. mathematics and logic and biology and chemistry as well yeah Anyway, back to my question. Yeah. Well, that's that was my answer. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah. No, cats. no, you idiot. The what cats. is in this house? Yeah, cats. <laughs> <laughs> cats. He invented cats. <laughs> <laughs> what else apart from cats? <laughs> Obviously, I'm aware. Just pretend this is any house. <laughs> of what? Well, of computing. Uh, what is yeah. in people's houses today? Anything with a computer yeah. in it. Anything, anything with, with the processing. Computer. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anything. Yeah. Uh, smart devices yeah yeah home appliances can think. all be the family tree the processing anything that's got a computer in it now that's co- that has yeah. that processing will be originated and we're talking to him not his dozens and dozens of equivalents of him well it's the descendant the descendant yeah, work in its, yeah. in its earliest embryonic but, stages sure would be he didn't well. invent the iPhone no, but, you know, <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. But the iPhone would have set, invented. set the grounds for it to be able to be yeah. invented. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone been in the loft? <laughs> I've been in the loft and there are no bodies. Skeletons. No skeletons. Yep. No notebooks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. They fetch a pretty secrets. penny. Yes, no secret scribblings. Imagine that. Found that. I say that I've just made it made it up there's a book somewhere <laughs> imagine if I had a book I just thought <laughs> um, there's some there's a statue in Manchester is the is this the one of someone else <laughs> no. there's many statues of Alan Turing many yes but there's one in um, there's one in Manchester of him sitting on a bench in a park there and there's a few things. There's a quote from, quotation by Bertrand Russell on it. Yeah. There is um, the words, a founder of computer science, but it's been translated as though it were encoded in an Enigma machine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Although, right, right. apparently not accurately. So no one really knows what it means. <laughs> is it symbols and <laughs> It's just something. groups of like five letters. Okay. Um, but the sculptor who created the statue, um, he buried his Amstrad computer under the plinth at the bottom in tribute to <laughs> the uh, father, the godfather of modern computers. So somewhere in there is a That's probably terrible the best place PC. Yeah. 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 Say. Somewhere there, Alan it's a really piece of, piece of complete rubbish. It's the, <laughs> yeah, exactly, it's yeah. the most useful it could be. Yeah. Buried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it for this time. Uh, I'd like to thank Jid and Rue, as always, but of course our special guest and our host, Sophie, thank you so much for letting us record in your home. And thank you for being a welcome um, addition to the team for this episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was an education. If you want to know more about what we've talked about on this episode, then just Google it or something. 
You can listen to all of our previous episodes on our website. That's www.truecrimediary.co.uk. Please remember to leave a review on your podcast provider if you can, or you can email us. That's stuff at truecrimediary.co.uk. And we'll see you again on next date in our True Crime Diary.